and a good Tuesday afternoon to you. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to be here with us for this hour of power that we call the Preterist Power Hour. This is a time for us to gather together and uh, to gain some clarity, perfectly some healing, some strategy in our lives regarding the power and progress of preterism is our usual introduction. However, this morning or this afternoon for that matter, let's talk about the kingdom of God. That's what we're talking about. When we mention these words, preterism, eschatology, soteriology, ecclesiology, to borrow all the ologies, we're simply talking about the truths about the kingdom of God. And that's our heart this afternoon. Uh, as many of you know, this is a special program. We usually go live 1030 a.m. on Mondays and Fridays. However, we take liberties to have guests join with us at different times. So uh, I'm excited to move in on our special guest or or special, yes, but returning guest, Ward Fenley, who's going to be here with us in a moment. Uh, Ward has continued to be a blessing in my life, spoken at a variety of conferences here at Blue Point Bible Church and elsewhere. I've had the privilege to join him as well in some of those conferences, and he's always a blessing. Anytime that I've ever listened to his uh, YouTube channel, NCMI Live, uh, I've been blessed by the, the lectures there, the kingdom focus, if you will. Uh, I always say that Ward Fenley tends to be one of my uh, my favorite kingdom of God preachers. Uh, again, we know that there's people that we might like teach preterism or soteriology. Ward would also be one of my soteriology guys. Um, you know, ecclesiology, uh, whatever it might be. We all have our maybe our different teachers that we like in those different areas. So I'm excited because what more should we be talking about than the kingdom of God? So uh, having Ward here with us is very exciting to me. And our goal this afternoon is going to be to talk about reformation and revival. Some of you may have uh, watched Ward's recent five-part series teaching about revival. I was very blessed by it. I encourage you, if you haven't, hopefully our time today will encourage you to go over there and view it. And if you did, uh, I hope that we'll expand on that a bit and further encourage you uh, from those videos. For those of you that don't know who I am, I'm Mike Miano. I am the pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church. I serve as the director of the Power of Preterism Network, which you can learn more about by visiting powerofpreterism.com. And uh, there you can learn about our variety of ministries and different efforts that we bring forth again, toward clarity, healing, and strategy. If you don't mind, I'm just going to take a moment to open us in a word of prayer, and then I'll bring us in on some introductory details, and then we'll jump right in on our interview with Mr. Ward Fenley. Let's pray. Mighty God, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to transcend, you know, local, uh, local lines, Lord, and boundaries, and, and be here on the internet and, and go across the nation, Lord, and talk with Ward and have each of us uh, here in New York. It's a little cold, quite a bit wet. So uh, we're warm inside our homes uh, here, uh, set and attentive to this interview. And of course, praying for those that are viewing through social media. Uh, again, consider the blessing that we have. Uh, Lord, we thank you. We praise you for all that we have. We thank you for giving everything to us pertaining to life and godliness. We thank you, Lord, for being revival. We thank you, Lord, for being reformation. We thank you, Lord, for being resurrection. And we praise you for those realities in our life. May we continually see revival happen. May we praise you, Lord, for an ever-reforming spirit. And of course, Lord, may we praise you that we've been moved out of death into life. We've been resurrected. We praise you, God. We ask that you go before us in our interview this afternoon and be praised all the more by our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So many of you know the Asbury Revival is like this hot topic. When you go on any social media forum, well, let me back that up. About three weeks ago, it was. And now it's sort of waning, you know, as every, every revival does, you know, contemporary revival does. Uh, praise God that the true source of revival never wanes. And that's Jesus Christ and his spirit and his kingdom. So about two months ago, I guess it's about that long, uh, there was this Asbury Revival in Kentucky. And it was very exciting for a lot of folks. And me, and I'm glad to say Ward, uh, true to spirit here, we're the type of people that will give you an ear, we'll hear about your revival, however, we might have some challenges, and uh, for me, one of my things is, is I'll regularly listen to someone share about a revival or an experience they have in their life, however, I also hope for the opportunity to ask questions, or to find the sensibility, you know, to find my own sensibilities with what someone might be sharing with me, or this revival of sorts, so what I did I'm a foundation guy. So I said, let's get right to the foundation. Where did this revival start? And uh, there was a message by a na man named Zach Meekreeb who preached on Romans chapter 12. And again, it seems as though this was a chapel service at a college. Uh, he was just the, the guest speaker for that day. And, and he came in and I've read some uh, 
post-sermon thoughts he had said to his wife, which was interesting. Uh, may we all be given such humility uh, when we go up in front of people. And he, again, I thought Zach, I'll say this, I thought Zach did a great job in that message. And he brought the people to Romans chapter 12 in helping understand what love looks like. And, and again, you know, we might disagree with certain aspects of the Asbury revival. However, I think we could all agree that we need more love in our world, just a little bit more love. And I think we could all take some time to go over to Romans chapter 12 and truly meditate upon what Paul was saying to the church at Rome, how they would walk in love, and ultimately how we, Christ church today, can walk in love as well. So I want to encourage you in that very, very thing. And, uh, you know, Reformation and revival have been on my, uh, my tongue, so to speak, for years. Uh, it was Vody Bauckham Jr. who said years ago that Reformation must precede revival. And uh, we know this in a, a contextual way, scriptural way, that yes, Christ came to bring reformation, to bring change, to bring the hope of Israel to the people. And through that reformation, he brought forth revival. Men were able to come to life in him. So that's the true source of reformation and revival. However, in a contemporary sense, I think it's okay for us to take note that in our contemporary settings, there's plenty of opportunity for change an opportunity to be enlivened, to, to maybe use a different word uh, than revival. And I've often been on some, you know, in, involved in some work in that regard, where we were offering reformation and revival, hoping that people would change their minds, and they would come to life or be enlivened in this new reality. So I've appreciated that a quote that always comes to mind for me, in light of a lot of things happening in the world today, and I'm sure we'll talk about this or in the Christian world for that matter, would be a quote from the book Beyond Creation Science by Tim Martin and Jeff Bond. And they said this, preterism will unleash a new vitality. I want you to hold on to that word. I know normally we hold on to preterism because this is the preterist power hour. However, I want you to hold on to new vitality today. That's what we're really talking about here. Will unleash a new vitality in the modern church because it naturally suggests a kingdom focus for all of life. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about revival, a kingdom focus for all of life. Take out the P word for the moment. You know, I get it. Uh, it, it tends to cause divisions, a lot of division in Christianity over preterism right now. Uh, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about that on our program today. However, let's set the stage right. We're not here to talk about preterism. And I've said this to people. I wouldn't talk about preterism unless Christ truly reformed and revived my life. There'd be no reason to talk about whether Jesus is coming, came, is, you know, et cetera. So for me, the kingdom of God is the source. And that's why I talk about preterism, because I believe that to be important in understanding the kingdom of God. However, our focus today is on the new vitality that, com that, that comes about in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts, when we understand the kingdom of God. And I pray that that's what... Uh, you'll find to bring fruit to your walk today that you'll be encouraged by. And I know Ward in his recent five-part series, he talked about uh, messianic corporate revival. And what I love about Ward is he brought us to the Old Testament. He helped us see what revival looked like, what was being hoped for in the Old Testament, and ultimately the, the pictures of revival that we see in the New Testament. And Ward helped us understand different words, which we all know is very important. Uh, we need to be careful with the verbiage we use unless we lead other people into confusion. So I'm hoping today our verbiage will be clarifying, uh, will be healing, and will provide strategy for you to manifest the kingdom of God in your life. So uh, with no further ado, let me go ahead and unmute Ward, uh, bring Ward in here for our discussion, and we'll jump right in on things, uh, talking about the kingdom of God. Good afternoon to you, brother. Good afternoon to you too, man. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Yeah, you know, you did a great job with that, that teaching series. And obviously, you're returning here, so we love having you on the Preterist Power Hour. And mm -hmm. my goal was to uh, have some time with you to catch up about, you know, what you were seeing with current day ref uh, revival and reformation, and uh, and again, just be blessed by your thoughts regarding the kingdom of God. So, thank you for taking time. How are you, brother? Share with us a bit what's been going on in the life of Ward Fenley since I think it was probably about a year ago that we heard from you here on our program. What's new with you? Uh, let's jump right into it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, golly, it's been, well, first of all, in the last couple of months, the weather here has been absolutely crazy. Um, I'm in, I'm just east of Sacramento. Um, and, and we have had these unprecedented storms, snow, <laughs> weird, only at 2,500 uh, feet. 
I mean, I mean, I know you guys are used to that stuff out there. In fact, you guys get snow at sea level, but it's just, it's just weird here, you know? Um, but um, yeah, you know, I've been by God's grace, been able to keep up with my YouTube channel and um, putting my messages and my Bible studies. So there's, there's the sermons that I give, and then there's the Bible studies that are separate. Those are just my personal things. Um, and thank God, you know, I've been able to keep up with the studies. Uh, in, in, I've been ministering with three, well, there were basically three dying churches. Um, and they, they couldn't find an ordained minister in their denomination, which is just absolutely fractured. Um, and for whatever reason, I think is because I, I'd been a music director in the United Methodist Church for, well, my first one was back in, I don't know, Pueblo, Colorado, 01 or 02, something like that. And it was just, you know, for making money. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't want that to come up, come across the wrong way. I mean, I, I, I believe that leading worship should be really Christ-centered and Christ-focused. Um, but, you know... <laughs> The denomination, historically speaking, has is, is just been void of the word of God. And uh, and I noticed that in that first ministry. And again, I've been a part of, I guess, four other United Methodist churches directing music. And the same thing, you know, that there's very little devotion to the word of God to Christ. It, it's the word of God is minimized. And so consequently, if the word of God is minimized, you minimize Christ. If you disparage the word, you disparage Christ because Christ is the theme of the word of God from Genesis to revelation. There's, uh, I see, I see Christ everywhere. You know, I, uh, in Esther, <laughs> I see Christ in Ruth. It's just everywhere. And so when you disparage or just discourage or minimize or even leave out, which basically they've done um, as a denomination, when you leave out the word of God, you leave out Christ and it becomes all about social action, social justice and social action, social justice without Jesus Christ is just impotent works. Okay. I'm not saying it doesn't accomplish some social good, but it doesn't without the foundation of Christ. I mean, all you got to do is look at the Pharisees, you know, they had all their, um, they had all their morality, all their obedience to the law, all their Torah. Uh, Paul even said he was blameless, but without Christ, all of his blamelessness, he said was dung, right? Much like Isaiah 64, all of our good deeds. I mean, if our good deeds are dung, you know, our bad deeds are dung, right? But here were these Pharisees who didn't have any bad deeds, but their hatred, they would obey the law, you know, but he says, you omit the weightier issues of mercy and justice. And by justice, I'm not talking about social justice. I'm talking about, hey, no one is superior to anybody else. And that's Micah 6, 8. Uh, what is, he says, he's shown you what is good to do justly. That's be fair. No one is superior. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God to love mercy. Go learn what this means. I want mercy and not sacrifice. And to walk humbly with your God. Well, you can't walk humbly with God if you think that you're more righteous than anyone else, right? And that's what the Pharisees, Pharisees did. And they were, uh, the Bible says they had contempt for others, you know? So anyway, that said, uh, it's been wonderful here. It's, it's just very, very strange. Um, I'm preaching the word of God. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching it without using the volatile terminology. I'm preaching it without... Uh, condemning anyone or anything like that. Uh, I've, I've been in that world. You know, I, I had a lot of history in the reform tradition where, you know, and I'm still sovereign grace, you know that, Michael, but where I was very, very critical and one of those ones, you know, throwing out anathemas left and right, just like what they're doing to, to Gary and what they did to David Shilton very much. That's a reform thing. So, and I hope we can kind of talk a little bit about the reformed and reforming and what real revival is, what is a real great awakening, right? Uh, what were Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield actually teaching? You know, yeah, they were sovereign grace, but 
there are some issues that I think we have to deal with. Why do reformers today have such a mean spirit? If you go back and look at them, even during the times of the Puritans, you know, they're calling people names and people say, well, that was just the culture. Well, you know, the Bible says instructing those in meekness. That's what he says, gentleness. So all of that kind of forms this perspective that I have of history, of revival, of reformation, of what we know is, is fulfillment, the kingdom of God and our spirits. How's it coming across? You know, our message is very important, but I just started a new series called Truth and Love and Inseparable Marriage or What God Has Joined Together, Let No Man Separate. And I'm just trying to show in that, that you can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. So that's just absolutely essential. And, and, and that should really guide our thinking as we approach these movements throughout history, right? What has happened? Why, why did it happen this way? Were the Puritans preaching truth? Some. Were they loving? Yeah, it's questionable. You know, mm -hmm. questionable when you look at their, what they've written and how they talked about people who disagreed with them. And man, that's something I have to constantly deal with, you know, and I'm, I'm very reactionary. That's my problem. I'm, I'm very reactionary. I remember, you know, when I first came to Sovereign Grace, my mom and my sister just were so mean. They were so mean to me. And then my sister came to Sovereign Grace. Eventually, mom came to Sovereign Grace in the kingdom. You know, I was so excited about the kingdom. I thought, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll quit here in a second. But I was so excited when I first came to it in, in 90 late 93, and especially in 94, when it wasn't just about time statements anymore. It was about, whoa, this, this is what this means, wolf and the lamb and the, you know, all this stuff, living waters. I was so excited. I was like, this is going to take off within five years. It's going to just storm evangelical Christianity and hopefully mainline, because, you know, now we had an argument against theological liberalism, you know, an argument to, to, to confront the guys like Schweitzer and, and Bertrand Russell. Well, man, it didn't happen. In fact, it was the exact opposite. It seemed like everybody was getting more hateful and people were calling me unsaved. These guys that I was fellowshipping with, these sovereign grace pastors, I, excommunicating me from their company, calling me damned. And so I'm like, oh yeah, well, you're damned, you know, and, and kind of that thing. And it just, it, it's, it's really sad. And I got to confess, even, it, you know, when I came out with teaching about the creation of the covenants you know i, I started writing on it in, in about around 01 but then you know i brought it up in a conference down there in florida and and got a few what, what did you mean by that you know are you saying that adam wasn't literal and then and then once i really started writing on it you know and, and being authentic and and full you know just basically not being ashamed to say what I feel God is telling us in, in Genesis, man, you got these guys come out. Oh, you know, you, you're, you're going to give ammunition to the evolutionists, you know, to the atheists. If you make Genesis, not about physical creation. And so then I just, I always have to work on my, my tone and not being reactionary and just, Hey, Jesus is king. <laughs> well, you know, actually, amen. I, and, and I want to agree with a couple of things you said and maybe uh, highlight some points. Uh, by the way, I'll agree with that first. So just yesterday on the Preterist Power Hour, we talked about how beautiful it is that God knows when to be merciful, when to be just, when to be forgiving, when to hold you to the standard, when God knows how to do all those things perfectly. Hopefully we feel compelled to grow in doing those things perfectly, but we know, you know, we're human. We're not going to do that. However, again, I want to give us a charge, but also give us grace. The charge is that we are to be like our father. We are to learn how to be those people in every circumstance, situations that need grace. We need to be gracious, uh, situations that need a little bit more structure and we need to be a bit stern. We need to learn these things. And I don't think we should be loosening the, you know, uh, the knot, so to speak in any one of those areas, but rather compelling ourselves to, again, give grace to ourselves that we're not going to do it perfectly. But at the same time, we are to, you know, I don't want to say strive because that sounds like works, but, you know, again, that we are to be possessing and increasing in the mannerisms that bring glory to God. And we shouldn't be lessening that. So I appreciate your journey, Warden. Um, I, 
I want to give you grace and also hold you to the standard at the same time. Uh, and then another thing I want to say, uh, in light of what you were sharing about where, you know, the, the congregations that you're, you're working within, uh, I'll say they, they have a good guy because, uh, you know, it's healthy that you're talking about revival and the way that you will get in on that here, the way that you shared it in your five part series, I found very beneficial, but I also find it, uh, good that they have you because here's a guy that can find Jesus in a book that doesn't even mention God, Esther, uh, you know, so praise God. You mentioned before you found Jesus and Esther. Uh, some folks know that that's the book that doesn't mention God's name. So uh, praise be to God for that. Ward, what I really appreciated about your revival series was that, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, what I sensed was in one sentence, kind of along the lines of what, I'm, what I just shared, you're giving grace. You might disagree, right? You said, uh, we should never expect someone to believe our subjective experience. I thought that was a great quote. However, on the flip side of that, you're not saying that their subjective experience is wrong. You know, and you also said that every day is an opportunity for revival. So as I listened, and you know, please jump in here. Uh, as I listened, I noticed there was this sense of, well, we should be skeptical when we hear people, you know, championing, 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 there we go, I'll get it, uh, revival uh, versus we should also appreciate when people mention revival. So, you know, what were your thoughts going into that series? And did that make sense? Uh, am I following along with your train of thought? Yeah, very much. I, I appreciate it. And, I, and I'm glad you like the series. And believe it or not, I'm actually not done. I know I've only uploaded five parts. Uh, I've probably got about oh, another three or four parts to go, um, spending some time in the New Testament. But uh, in my own, evaluation of, of of church history it, it it's kind of hard to evaluate church history from oh gosh i would say the, the 100s to the time of martin luther you know second century the time of martin luther just because you didn't have a whole lot of documenting of real revival right you, you just didn't see a whole lot of that and i mean certainly you didn't see a whole lot of it in, in the east and and in the west and roman catholicism but when you get the problem is is when you get to the reformation you look at luther and you thank god for it, okay you thank god for what he was doing but you also are are very aware that there was a spirit going on you know there was there was there was still you know he was a monk and he was oh you know they were he was upset over indulgences and upset over justification by works and so then you have this counter reformation right and you have the council of trent and all these anathemas against you know the the protestants the early protestants and and Anathema breeds anathema. And, that, and that's kind of why I have spent a little bit of time in this latest series I just started called Truth and Love. Um, what God has joined together, let no man separate. We're not Jesus. We're not even inspired apostles. We're members of the kingdom of God, which is wonderful. But an inspired apostle or Jesus, they, they threw out some anathemas especially Jesus, you know, he threw out these anathemas, uh, you know, commit blasphemy against the spirit He's not going to be forgiven in this age nor in the age to come, or, you know, how can you escape the damnation of hell? And that's, and reformers kind of love that, you know, they love taking that spirit upon them. Now, remember I'm sovereign grace, so I'm not condemning anyone. I'm just saying that when you first come, I heard this phrase, you know, when we first come to sovereign grace, we become caged Calvinists. We're just like, oh, you know, we're so mad. And we go to tell everybody about this and there's fighting. And anyway, the point is, as we evaluate something like Asbury or something like the Great Awakening, we have to look at, the, at it holistically. Even the Protestant Reformation, we're so used to that term reformation and reformed and re reformed and always reforming right as we're seeing the modern day reformers are not reforming they are not 
when you talk to them about the glorious kingdom of God, they're not reforming, you know, they're just anathematizing. That's not reforming. And I would say that it's possible that maybe they never did have that spirit. There was a, there was a change going from works to grace, but there was all this other stuff that was riding along with it. And there's clanging cymbals and noisy gongs. And that, that, I guess that's what's so humbling for me is First Corinthians says, you can understand all mysteries and have faith is to move mountains. But if you don't have love, it profits you nothing. Hmm. It's, it's vice versa there, right? If, if you don't have truth, your love is not real love. But if you don't have love, all this knowledge and faith right? It profits you nothing. And if anything, it makes you noisy and clanging and very likely could make people hate what you're actually trying to convey that is so beautiful. Hmm. Man, I, I, I know I've done that in my life and still do occasionally. I go back and I look at stuff and I'm just like, gosh, Lord, I'm 56. I've been a sovereign gracer for over 30 years, kingdom just about 30 and I'm still struggling with this stuff and have these rough edges. So that's the thing we need to really examine. Okay, is Asbury, what's its root? Well, it's Wesleyan holiness. Well, we both know there's some incredibly uh, problematic areas for Wesleyan holiness, Wesleyanism and the holiness movement. Then what is the definition of repentance? That word is so abused. It is so abused. And I think until we understand, I mean, you look at the way MacArthur uses it, you look at the way Sproul uses repentance, right? They use it to be repentance from moral degradation or moral vices or moral problems. The Pharisees had no moral issues. And John says, repent. So what... What does metanoia really mean? I believe it means, like a lot of people say, you're changing from the belief, the mindset that you can save yourself. Mm -hmm. Self-righteousness. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's what Hebrews means when it says, you know, leaving those things, you know, repentance from what? Dead works. Mm -hmm. Works of iniquity. I don't think that's going to brothels. I think works of iniquity is self-righteousness good deeds that are done for self and trying to earn the favor of God. So there's a, there's a lot of examination that has to, has to be done when we, when we look at something like the Great Awakening, Toronto Blessing, Brownsville Revival, Azusa Street, you know, all, all that stuff and up to this Asbury thing, you know. Amen. And would you say that, I appreciate what you're saying there, would you say that there's something that can be learned that, for example, these revivals that are happening, uh, is there opportunity for that metanoia to happen there in the midst of that? It, would you say that that's happening uh, in these scenarios as well? Y yes, I think I would be foolish and it would almost be sort of uh, antithetical to what I believe about the sovereignty of God. If I said that no good could come from it, you know, right. um, I think that God speaks into the hearts of his people, wherever they are. And he can use a scripture to convict them and show them their desperate need for him. Absolutely. And then, of course, you know, in the series, I, I ask people to evaluate the word revival. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Does it mean, oh, people coming to Christ? Or does it mean true believers now being reinvigorated, you know, in, in their faith, in the grace of God, the glory of Jesus, the kingdom of God, which is prominent. I mean, the kingdom is huge, you know, and that's why you and I are doing what we do. It's not just sovereign grace. It's the whole thing. It's all about Christ and his kingdom and his glory and his exaltation. So, Amen. yeah. You know, I appreciate the redefinition. What's that? I'm not trying to make things complicated. No, no. I, I thought actually in the, in that series, you, you made, you gave a great definition of revival and it was acknowledgement of God's greatness. And again, as you rightly just said, uh, it's believers in Christ who have, you know, passed out of death into life that now can experience revival in our lives when 
we see the greatness of God in contrast to our own self-effort, self-righteousness, etc. So I thought you outlined that very well uh, in that uh, conversation. So I, I guess I want to flip that a bit. And actually, you know what? I wanted to ask you another question now that in line with what you were sharing before. So we see reformation happening right now. Reform, we, we talk about revival. We say that's acknowledgement of God's greatness. We talk about uh, repentance, you know, going running against self-righteousness. And then reformation would be a change of one's mind, right? Or a change of reality uh, in that regard. Would you agree with that definition? Yeah. Yeah, I would. Like, uh, okay. So I've, I've probably brought this up before. You have the guy that says, ever since I, I came to Christ, I've never stepped foot in a bar. Right? I'm like, well, you know what? I think it was after I became a Christian that I first stepped into a bar, <laughs> you know? In fact, it was after I w w had been a pastor for five years that I became an alcoholic. I'm like, whoa, what, what's going on? What does this really mean? What, what is revival? What, what is reform? My reformed life? I mean, some of the most beautiful, humble adorers of Jesus Christ who are just amazed at his grace uh, that i know are in the throes of addiction whatever that addiction may look like you know we tend to re relegate you know, we, we tend to say uh look at things like substance abuse as right. addiction you know we don't look at things like greed as addiction you know there's God. plenty of things to be addicted to yeah let's be clear amen yeah. like like james says we all stumble in many ways sure but the one who has control of his tongue or her tongue, that is a complete person. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Uh, the reason I wanted to ask you that was I was thinking about what you were sharing there about, about reformers, right? So there's this current conversation happening in reformed Christianity uh, where, you know, they're grappling about time texts and, uh, you know, what this whole reality is about, this Christian reality, Christian worldview, if you will. And, uh, what I've noticed in reformed conversations, I'll just keep it there for a moment, is this joke, and you alluded to it before, that, you know, the reformed community is one of the meanest communities in Christianity. You know, I, I, and I, it's sad that it's actually become a joke that's acceptable among reformed believers, where I'll, I'll give a quick story. Uh, about a year ago, I had a plumber uh, come into my home, and, you know, we, we got to talking about the Lord, and then he let me know, you know, I'm reformed. And I guess that was supposed to, you know, make me fall to my knees or something. And I said, well, so am I, uh, you know, I said, I believe in sovereign grace. I said, I have a problem uh, with the Calvinistic reformed community because they tend to be, as you, you noted, uh, putting up stops against further reform, uh, where we see the reformed community was a semper reformanda ecclesia est, you know, the church is to be always reforming, not just reformed from Catholicism. And then we, you know, we stop because now we have our own creeds. Why do you suppose, and I think you've already alluded to it, but I'm just curious to hear from you. Why do you suppose it is that these reformed traditions, the reformed attitude sort of veers off and goes into, is it just the, would you say it's the mind and heart of man? I'm curious to how you would respond to that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think it, it is. It just boils down to uh, the fruits of the spirit. Okay. Um, Paul Paul's theology was incredibly holistic. Um, if we're just about the creation of the covenants and we just like obsess over that, we're not holistic. Mm -hmm. If sovereign grace or deity of Christ or fulfillment. If, if you look at Jesus's message, I mean, let's, let's look to the, the source, God almighty, right? the one who penned the word of God through fallible humans. Here's Jesus talking about his kingdom, talking about love, talking about mercy. I mean, he, man, he hammered mercy big time. Uh, he hammered the Pharisees uh, about not having mercy, about saying, I thank you that I'm not like him right? Instead, how many of us actually say, Lord, I, I'm just like Hitler. Mm. 
I, I'm just like Genghis Khan. I'm just like Richard Ramirez. I am just like Jeffrey Dahmer. Might not eat people, but my mentality, my gravitation, the thoughts, you know, isn't it about the thoughts? Isn't that what Jesus said? You, you think it in your heart, you've done it. And so I think what happens is, is then with reformers, again, it's that whole, there's the reactionary thing. And we are very quick to take vengeance. Sure. Romans. That's my, God says, that's my domain. We, we've got now, oh, and some of these people, here's another thing. We take Jesus's teaching about loving one another. Love your enemies. Bless them who persecute you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. And we take that, and some people, like it's, reformers are notorious for this, and other people too. Well, that was for back then. So in this endeavor to be cessationist or whatever, we, in, we go back to this military, this militant uh, perspective of reformation. And we're, and we're no different. So I would just say that patience, and if there's one thing the Lord is, is teaching me, it, it's that it has taken him 30 years of long suffering with my slow, mm -hmm. slow journey to understand the kingdom. He's so patient with me. He's so tender. And then I discover something that's just so beautiful and wonderful in the scripture. And I put it out there and people aren't latching on to it. And I'm like, what's your problem? How can you can't see this? Y you know, you dummy. Man, if God, if God applied that mentality to me, I, well, I don't know. I, I, I would be dust. And called dummy all day. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think that God is just saying, look, be paid. What does he say? The servant of the Lord, you've quoted it. The servant of the Lord must not strive, you know, but be gentle, not quarrelsome, right. apt to teach, patient, Amen. gentle. And gosh, I just, you know, my apologies again. I mean, it's like every time, like when, we, when you and I talk in between the times that we talk, I have this large amount of junk that has emanated from me online or in person. And, and I just have to say, sorry, I am so sorry for my lack of gentleness, even as recent as this last week, you know, I, I, I just am struggling. And here he says, let your gentleness be made known to all. It's just this constant battle with me. I'm constantly working at constantly asking for people to pray for me. So I really do believe that if the world could see our kindness, the truth just is magnified. Yeah. It's magnified. It's not, it can't be kindness without truth. It has to be married. So. Amen. Amen. And, you know, there's three areas I wanted to talk to you about particularly. And I think, I, I know, I don't think we could agree that kindness and grace and patience, patience is necessary in these three areas of uh, let's say revival and reformation, or to flip it around, reformation and revival. Uh, and those three things I wanted to bring up was the first one uh, is kind of basic. Uh, years ago, uh, when I was an intern back in you know 2010, uh, folks would say things like, "Biblical illiteracy has overtaken the church." And you know I would go around. You could talk to almost anybody, and they would say, "Yeah, Christians are biblically illiterate." And now I think we've gotten to a point where almost every Christian community on the planet would probably say, yeah, you're right. Biblical illiteracy is a problem for the Christian community, whether you're Catholic, Baptist, whatever it might be, biblical illiteracy. And again, we're not just talking about the people sitting in pews. We're talking about, you know, pastors, preachers, uh, those that are being given leadership positions. Unfortunately, biblical illiteracy is a problem. So I wanted to ask you, and the reason I'm leaning in on this is, uh, so in 2014 or 13, I did a debate, and this kind of leads in on that biblical illiteracy conversation. Uh, I brought up the Bible was written for us, but not necessarily to us, or to flip it around the way that a lot of folks say it is, the Bible was not written to us, but for us. So uh, I was mocked during that debate back in 2014. 
only for 2019 to roll around. And now if you were to pick up some Christian magazines at the store and flip through them, interestingly enough, you'll read a lot of New Testament scholars saying things like, the Bible was not written to you, but for you. So for me, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts, that sounds like a revival. That sounds like a reformation happening in our midst where I think there's a variety of different reasons why people are saying, maybe we do need to learn something about the Bible, uh, you know, in the context of the Bible, et cetera. Do you see that reformation and revival happening in our current day? So, yes, I do. I do. And I, I see it sort of basically from this kind of, uh, oh, this, what was going on at the time of Luther, right? You have the printing press, Gutenberg printing press. And so, yes, people were becoming aware of the scriptures. Our problem, okay, is right alongside that, we have this post-enlightenment spirit of higher criticism. Mm. And, and so now, in the name of pseudoscience, they are... So yeah, there's awareness of the scripture, but then there's quote awareness of the scripture. And so they're, they're looking to find ways to discredit it. And it's coming from the ivory towers, not just of, you know, secular universities, but supposed Christian seminaries or theological seminaries, you know, uh, so much that it's, it's not called a master of divinity in Christianity. It's, it's more of a master of divinity in religion right? Religious studies, you know, you see Harvard, Princeton, it's, it's, it's more of a, 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 a it's, it's about religion. And the Bible, it's a very low view of scripture, a very low view of scripture. So not to be discouraging, yes. But like I said, like Ecclesiastes says, there's nothing new under the sun, right? There's always going to be pagan influence upon the scripture. And there's always going to be bad examples of those who do believe the scripture. Mm -hmm. And, but universally, I believe this is true. What is desired in a person is kindness. You see that in Proverbs. Universally, I think this is true. A soft answer turns away wrath, right? right? So we've got this beautiful uh, bastion of truth in the, in the word of God. And Jesus and the knowledge of the kingdom is just, you know, yes, it is spreading. And as I'm so glad now because all the reformed pastors and seminaries now know about fulfillment. They know it. So I, I don't know a person. I don't know a, an educated reformer who does not know about fulfillment. They do I say it's heresy, but they know about, it. you know? So yes, I, I do agree, but it's with, uh, with that little kind of caveat there's also more attacks against it as we grow in this supposed intelligence or knowledge of it. Yeah, I appreciate that you, you marked that out because there is, there's an influx of knowledge. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that it's all good, right? That every, you know, everybody that's listening and reading and learning is doing it for the right intent. Uh, you know, these things are spiritually discerned, the Apostle Paul says. So um, while I appreciate the higher criticism and things like that, that are causing people to seek, search, study, improve, I also know what's somebody's intent. You know, your intent means a lot, you know, when you're entering in on these things. So, yeah, I appreciate your, uh, the way of, of framing that. Um, then obviously another thing that comes out, actually, this comes right in line with what you were sharing earlier about your views of Genesis and then um, even with higher criticism. So what ended up happening was, so then we see, okay, now let's get into the Bible. Let's learn about it. What does it actually say? And we go to the beginning of the Bible, right? And then now, you know, uh, there's all these different ideas. There's young earth creationism, old earth, all these names people have put on interpretations of what's going on in early Genesis. And then in the midst of that, and by the way, I, I have to plug the book Beyond Creation Science because it does lead in on a lot of this history. Um, in the same time that men are beginning to say, yeah, we do need to have a, a desire for biblical things. Um, and this is going back, obviously, what, 1800s or something like that. Um, here in the 1800s, now all of a sudden develop these other ideas. Well, you know, the by you know, uh, Darwinism and, and a lot of these different theories that were popularized in the 1800s, um, it began to compete with the Bible. 
And the reason I bring that up is it reminds me of what we were talking about this whole session so far is a willingness to get, be patient with people. You know, sometimes somebody, they don't understand. So we have to learn how to help them deal with these problems, you know? All right. So, you know, somebody hears about Christianity. They say, oh, you're one of those people that believes that the earth was created in 6,000 or six days, 5,000 years ago. And it's like, all right, well, let's be patient. We don't have to jump on them right away, but we can learn how to explain, you know, well, let me explain where that idea came from. And then let me help propose to you, uh, you know, maybe another perspective, something to think about. And uh, I'm sure you, you've you seen this, uh, this covenant creation idea, or even, you know, just a different way of reading, uh, rather than hyper literalism in Genesis, uh, we've seen people come out and, and begin to understand these things, as I mentioned, beyond creation science, uh, you know, what are some of your thoughts in that regard? Have you seen that conversation becoming more clarifying and patient, or does it seem like we're going the other direction uh, in that regard? Yeah, uh, yeah, and I'm glad you asked that. Um, so, I don't know, I think it was around 08 or something, I had done a, a podcast, well, before that, you know, there's a lot of discussion with, um, you know, some of these Calvinists online who are believers in fulfillment, and I was, you know, I, these guys, I'd known them for a long time. Let's, let's just put it that way. I had known them since, oh gosh, it, online, you know, pal talk day. You, remember, you probably heard a lot about that. And I'd known all these guys uh, on pal talk. And so they knew me as sovereign grace fulfillment. And, but, you know, I was, I was seeing some things about Adam, Eve, seeing some things in Genesis that were clearly motifs genre motifs not literal necessarily motifs you know i do i believe that the tree of life was literal no i don't do i believe that all of the genesis uh, account one through three well maybe even even beyond that you know one through eight do i do i believe it was all uh just metaphor and all just allegory no i don't uh I, but as I was putting things out there, suggesting possibilities, uh, it just seemed like people were mad at it, you know, because like I said, they, they're afraid I'm going to take away their arguments against atheists. You know, I was like, that, that was never a concern in, among the biblical writers. It was never a concern. It, Romans 1, I don't believe it was uh, Paul's concern. Paul, I don't think Paul was talking about Gentiles there. I think Paul in Romans one. I'm uh, I, I'm just about uh, done with a a study about Romans one, showing that it's about the Israelites. It's not about you know the okay Gentiles can look up, see the sun, and say, oh, I know there's a God, right? Now logic would tell us, I think, that there's an intelligent designer, but it wouldn't tell us it was God, the God of the Israelite Yahweh, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, but I but hey. There are atheists. They're bona fide atheists. I'm not one of these guys like Bonson or, or Sproul, where they say, you know, in both of them, different uh, views of apologetics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, both of them and say, yeah, the atheists, they know there's a God, but they just suppress it. I don't take that approach. And so when I look at Genesis, I, I look at it. And, and if there is a physicality, it's, it's illusion from my perspective. Well, they automatically assume, oh, he's going liberal. No, as a matter of fact, I would say, I think that view of scripture where you're trying, you're seeing Jesus, you're seeing covenant, you're seeing God, what God is really about. And that is desiring to make covenant with people, not about cosmos. Amen. It was just like a given, you know, they, they of course, God created all this stuff. So he uses this illusion, right? Things like firmament, beasts, dominion, all this stuff. You say, yeah, yeah, sure. How literal? I, I just, these people who are making mountains out of molehills and, and making it about old earth creation or young earth creation and fighting over that. I just, it's like watching a Jehovah's Witness in a Mormon fight. You just want to say, hold on. That, that's not what it's about. Neither is Psalm 119, one through six, you know? Look at it from a messianic perspective, a covenantal perspective. I'm not saying just totally dismiss. And I don't have all the answers, Michael. I, I don't. No. 
I don't have the answers. I don't think Tim Martin. I don't think J.L. Vaughn does. We don't have all the answers about Genesis. It's difficult. I don't have all the answers about fulfillment. First Corinthians 15, you know, I just think if our mindset, you remember what you said earlier, you were talking about our mindset. Mm -hmm. If our mindset is always this, Jesus, please be glorified in my studies. Be glorified as I look at Genesis. Cause me to see you more clearly. I don't think we can go wrong there. I don't, I, it doesn't mean we know everything, but I don't think we can go wrong. And so, like I said, back to the whole thing, when I got attacked for it, I reacted. Mm -hmm. And I just want these people, because I loved these people. I still love them. You know, I, there's one guy I love him to death. His name's Mike Bennett. He's a cool guy, you know. I and and I really believe that Mike Bennett and I could have some good conversation about it, but I have not been uh loving to him all the time. And I just think he's a great guy. You know, I think I think he's awesome. And I hope one day that we can just sit down and talk about it in a way that is uh, not so volatile. Amen. You, you know, and, and I've been in those conversations with Mike, so I appreciate, uh, you, you know, what you're saying there. And I think we could all, and I'm sure Mike would even agree, uh, we could all pray for a bit more graciousness, a bit more patience uh, with each other in our different understandings. And uh, yeah, you know, it really, it, it boils down to patience. And I love what you said, matter of fact, about the glorification of God, because just yesterday, we ended our program talking about if we can leave every conversation, every Bible study, every argument, just giving people an opportunity to say God is glorious, God is good. We've done a good job. Even if, you know, we didn't get them to understand eschatology or a protology for that matter, if we can just have a conversation, and that's what I'm hoping, you know, when we talk about the kingdom of God, I would hope our ethos is that we can come together, we can agree to disagree on certain things. Uh, what I think the reformation and revival in our current day is, is exactly that. How can Christians learn how to be gracious? How can we learn how we don't always have to agree? Again, you bet you mentioned church history before. Uh, you know, you go back into the, the first couple centuries of the church. These folks were trying to figure it out. You know, they weren't, it wasn't, this is what it has to be. You read Justin Martyr, he mentions that there's people that have a different view on the resurrection than he does. You just journey into church history and all of a sudden, you know, and I mean, let's be clear, we don't have to go into church history. We could read our New Testament. In the New Testament, you have Paul and Peter, you have uh Barnabas and, and I think Paul, right? Uh, you know, Barnabas and Mark, whoever, whatever it was. Uh, either way, you have all these different divisions. Then in Corinth, you have, you know, everybody always focuses on Jew and Gentile. But more recently, what I've noticed and I've been teaching is that actually it was Jew and Jew in Corinth. There were Jews, Alexandrian Jews. Oh gosh, you better not let those folks in here. Uh, you know, Jews disagreeing with other Jews on the ways they would come to understand uh, the details. So there's so much division in the early church, yet they knew, let's build upon the rock. Let's build, you know, up this beautiful reality. And my point is, is when you, by the time you get into church history, yeah, there was a lot of divisions and we've done a great job of fostering that in our current day, uh, you know, denominations, divisions, distinctions. However, they learned how to work together. And I believe that, you know, I said to somebody just yesterday in a conversation, I said, you can add whatever adjective you want to preterism. And that's fine with me. I'd love to hear you out. And welcome your, your conversation in that regard. But let's have the conversation. Let's not ignore it. Let's be patient with each other. And, and I believe that's how we can move toward a greater unity. And, uh, you know, so Ward, I know that it was a lot more, believe it or not, I actually wanted to talk to you about today, but I know an hour goes fast. And, um, you know, you have put out this teaching on revival. So I do want to make sure folks know if you need more exhaustive understanding of revival, go ahead and visit Ward's uh, five sessions so far. As he mentioned, he plans to go back to that and build on top of that. And um, yeah, again, Ward, uh, you know, I'm hoping that our conversation today might just be a, a little stone thrown into this larger Reformation and Revival conversation, and that we would just have a little bit more gracious and patience with each other, and also leaning on resources that are out there to benefit ourselves. So um, I want to go ahead and bring some folks on, but I want to make sure I give you opportunity to, to share some thoughts before I unmute some mics. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I, you, can't, you can't repeat it enough that Jesus, as, as he's sitting there talking to his people, 
saying they're a, a city on a hill, letting their light so shine. I don't think he was talking about the light of, the, of moralism. No. He said, by this, all people will know you're my disciples, you're followers of me. And what's interesting is you go into the book of Acts and it says those mean Pharisees, you know, chief priests, Pharisees, elders, it says they looked at the unlearned disciples. And this, oh gosh, this has just been so, um, it's made such an impression on me. It says they perceived they had been with Jesus. Mm right? Mm -hmm. They were unlearned, but they had been with Jesus. Well, what were they seeing? Well, Jesus says, they will know you're my, they will know you're my disciples, you Christians, by your love, by your love for each other. Mm -hmm. So when the world on the outside is looking at us being all snarky, you know, and, and calling each other names and throwing out anathemas, Christians toward Christians, they're, I don't want to, I don't want any part of that. And, and in all honesty, I think that this kind of weighs in, I'll cut this short, but this, this really weighs in on this whole LGBTQ issue. So it's not, it's not that I support the, the lifestyle, right? Any more than I support areas in my life that are disobedient to God, right? It's not, it's not that. It's what if we were loving everyone with the love of Christ, not anathematizing, leaving that for Christ. That's mm -hmm. his, his world. That's his area. He's God. The Bible says there's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy, right? What if we had from very early on not made these distinctions between sins? And what if we approached everybody with that kind of grace and mercy that Jesus did with the, you know, the adulterous woman or the woman at the well with that, man, I love you. I care for you. I want to sit down. I want to talk with you. Tell me about what happened to you. What is happening now? Being authentic, not trying to hide our own junk too. You know, that's one of the things I love to do when I'm talking with unbelievers. I love to tell them about my problems, my current problems, my current struggles. You know, then it gives me an opportunity to talk about what Jesus means to me, right. you know? So I don't know if that related to your question. Oh, I did. I appreciate your point. You actually gave me some notes. I was sitting here writing a, you know, I have a three-part uh, survey I'm going to put out to the internet uh, later today. And it's going to be, how would you know that you were speaking to a Pharisee, right? So that'd be a good question. How would you know that you were speaking to a Pharisee? And I think we all know the phrase Jesus said, you lay burdens on men's backs and you do nothing to help them, right? There's a bunch of other phrases I could use. That's how I would know I was talking to a Pharisee. They're laying burdens on me without doing anything to help me. Uh, how would you know you're talking to a Christian? I think you brought up a great, a great one. You know, these men discern these men were Christians by what? Their courage, their grace, their love uh, for one another, their love for others. Even I love that quote from, uh, I think it's the second century. Uh, there's a quote where it says, the Christians not only help them, the, those of their own flock, but they even begin to help our people. Uh, you know, the, the Roman community was like so baffled by these Christians. Uh, so that's how you would know a Christian. And then the third question I'll ask is, how would you know that someone is definitely not a Christian? Hmm, that's a tricky one, huh? Uh, you know, because, you know, they probably boast in self-righteousness. Uh, they're not humble. They're not willing to learn. So, uh, you know, I'm going to put that out there and I'm sure it'll cause some uh, frustration for folks, but so be it. We need to, you know, we need to experience reformation and revival right now in our current day, uh, in our own lives, dare I say, when it comes to the gentleness, the mercy, the grace of God. So right. thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you for being a, a witness to the beautiful grace of God mm -hmm. and uh, for your teaching there. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute some folks and see if there's any questions here uh, from some people or some further comments, and uh, we'll sort of move the show to a close. And of course, I hope you won't be a stranger here because there's a lot more we could be saying about Reformation and revival that we haven't covered, but I imagine it's a conversation we'll have again. Yeah, amen. Edward, yeah. I see you're unmuted. You want to jump in, brother? Yes, I have one to share. According to the discussion, you know, it's not what you say, but how you say it. 
Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we want to, don't want to be guilty of robbing God, like the Pharisees and stuff like that, as far as, you know, trying to, you know, give uh, uh, work, works of self-righteousness, you right. know, saying that, you know, God, you can't, you know, be angry with us because we did this and that for you. You know, we sacrificed for you. You know, we, you know, uh, gave you these animal sacrifices. So you can't be angry with us, you know, stuff like that. So they're robbing God, you know, in a sense with their uh, sacrifices. And then you have the church has a difficult task with the different, uh, different levels of understanding and different ideas and Christian beliefs. So the church has a difficult task in trying to, you know, unify people and get people, you know, not on the same page, but to listen to one another, you know, give, give each other grace to where, as you know, you know, hear each other out and, you know, uh, just be able to conversate with one another without being hostile towards each other just because we think differently. You know, yeah. that, uh, where Elijah called down uh, fire, you know, on the idolaters with uh, little, t- little to no effect. But God told him to use love, humility, and like gracefulness. And Elijah had greater success in, commu- in, in uh, getting through to the people. And uh, lastly, I have a kind word turns away wrath, like uh, Ward had mentioned. And we require a zeal empowered by knowledge. That's what we need to uh, be endeavoring in, a zeal empowered by knowledge to increase and ever be reforming. Edward, uh, I appreciate you, brother. And you know what, you gave me a good idea that, you know, a difference between a know-it-all and a listen-to-all. You know, we are to be the people that would listen to all and welcome in different opinions and perspectives, not necessarily agree, but people should feel comfortable coming to us and saying, you know, Mike, Ward, Edward, uh, they'll listen to me. They'll at least listen to my perspective, hear me out, uh, rather than what we've unfortunately come to be known as is know-it-alls. The Christian community, we're always pointing our fingers. You know, we have it right. And I think there's a lot that we need to learn from being a know-it-all. Let's pray that we would transition from know-it-alls to listen to alls. Uh, that's what I'm hoping we might see in our lives. And also, you, you, uh, you stole my closing quote, Edward. Um, you know, uh, back in 2019, interestingly enough, I wrote this comment, no revival, no reformation can do what a radical reframation of Bible prophecy and the gospel in their proper context can do zeal empowered by knowledge. So amen. And that's what I believe we should be chasing after. It's not always about a new reformation or a new revival, but rather reframing the Bible so that it speaks God's message as it was intended. And it has the effect on us that it was intended to have. That's what we should be running after, not a a new revival or a new reformation, but a radical reframation of God's word and how it applies to us. What do you think, Ward? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, I I was very much, uh, very, oh, what's the word? I I don't want to come across uh, to these people who, you know, profess to really love truth. I don't want to come across to them like I'm compromising Mm-hmm. grace. And of course, you know, my, my, I believe it's real grace, sovereign grace. Okay. And, and, and the same with the kingdom, but we, there was kind of this separation, separatist mentality, uh, isolating, you know, don't be with the sinners. Right. And sometimes taking a Jesus circumstance or context and trying to uh, apply it to today, you know, uh, the Pharisees were the enemies of the cross, as far as Paul was concerned, as far as Jesus. And and I think that, you know, people are saying, well, Jesus is waiting to put all his enemies under his footstool. And they'll say, oh, that's the LGBT community. And that's the atheist community and the secular community and the communist community, the Chinese, you know what? They're, and so that because they've taken the word enemies out of that context, They've made it moral enemies. Whereas Jesus is saying the enemies of the cross are these Pharisees who were moral. They were believers in Yahweh, right? Or Yahweh. Paul, same thing. He says, man, they have a a zeal, but they have not zeal for God, it says, but they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God, right? And so I just want to give one quick example. 
uh, where I, God is helping, you know, helping me grow, causing me to grow in this area. I'm not, I haven't, don't have it mastered, but there's this little thing we do at this one church. It's like, they're all about just social functions, right? And they have an open mic night. And so I went to this open mic night and it's just, you know, any kind of me, a Christian, secular, whatever. And there's just one girl there, and she kind of had this hard spirit. And she's, she's a lesbian atheist. Okay. Normally most Christians go, Oh God, that's my enemy. And I'm going now it used to be, yeah, she would be my enemy. Now I'm going, Oh, another one who struggles, another human being who needs God's grace. Right. And so I get into this conversation with her and we're very open, even kind of joking about it. Right. And I know I don't want to be irreverent or, or joke about heavy duty things, but I'm trying to become all things to all people. What did Paul say to those without law? Right. I became as one without law to those under the law. You know, it's, it's, it's like, what is our mental? How can I love that woman and make her want to dialogue with me and, and, and possibly explore Jesus with her and God's grace. So anyway, I mean, obviously we know God alone and, and this, I'll finish here again, sovereign grace reformers they turn the sovereignty of God into sort of this arbitrary, I'm just going to change someone's heart, but you know, convert them. Well, God says with cords of loving kindness, I have drawn you. Hmm. And when you can join that with John 6, 44, he said that in Jeremiah 31, when you can join that with John 6, 44, which we quote as sovereign grace people, uh, no man can come to me except the father, which has sent me draw him drag, right? When you put, so how does God drag with cords of loving kindness? How does that loving kindness work through the people of God? You right. know, well said, amen. I want to go ahead and give everyone else opportunity. Uh, I know Alvin's here and, and Deacon oh. Brian, Sandy, if they wanted to jump in. Edward, you had something you want to say? Go ahead. I just want to say one line, uh, not to rather to be, not to be ashamed of the gospel. So you don't have to, um, uh, dummy down your message or things of this nature. Uh, you want to uh, not be ashamed of the gospel, but like Ward said, you know, of, about, you know, meeting people where they are and stuff like that. You know, we want to use wisdom and stuff in that regard, but we don't want to be ashamed of the gospel and not share the gospel just because, you know, to be people pleasers. That's it. Amen. Yeah, there's, again, there's a, uh, a strategy, if you will, to walking in love. Uh, there's, you know, your, your speech should be seasoned with salt. Your, you know, not every context, as Ward highlighted there from Romans, uh, not every context is going to be the same. To some people, you're going to be without the law, to borrow that language. Some people are going to be with the law. Uh, I don't know. Obviously, we know context, but either way, you know, take the application of those points. And there are going to be times where we need to be strategic in the way that, you know, we love people. Like I said at the beginning, you, you know, there's times where God is just and God is merciful. Uh, and then, you, you know, there's times where God is, you know, again, all the different attributes we see throughout scripture, God knows how to use them right when they should be used at his right times, right? That the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law. So God does these things at just the right time. And we need to be taking that in as well. There's a time and a place to maybe battle it out, you know, and argue. There's a time and a place to appreciate and agree, or even agree to disagree, uh, you know, we need to take, take these things in. And I believe that's a big part of considering reformation and revival in our day is desiring for it to be the way God would do it rather than the way that man, you know, we're very, uh, this is the way that it has to be done. Uh, that's not God's attitude. So I hope we might take that to heart. Uh, I didn't see anyone else unmuting. So Ward, I'm going to give you the opportunity. Uh, you want to share any uh, last thoughts with us or anything that you want to mention before we close out? Yeah, I really appreciate what Edward said. Uh, it, there's, there's been this, and I know you've seen this happen within, like, say, for instance, preterism is they go to these extremes where it's like, oh, well, it's all fulfilled. Um, you know, everybody's in the kingdom and all this. And so now truth becomes minimized, right? Mm -hmm. And it's in, in the word of God, again, becomes minimized. And uh, Edward, right on the money. We, we should never be ashamed of the gospel, which is Christ, right? 
because it says, for it is the power of God, right? That's Christ. That is Christ. The Bible says Christ is the wisdom and power of God, right? So n never be ashamed of the truth. I don't think that, I think we have to be like, Michael, you said it, strategy, right? I think God honors it when we're really careful. And I'm not always careful this way, like being in certain circumstances, just throwing out a volatile term, like, and I don't say this anymore. Anyway, I'm just sovereign. Great. I don't say I'm a Calvinist. Okay. Sure. In the right context, like if I'm trying to relate to some post-millennial reconstructionist, maybe there, you know, oh yeah, I'm a Calvinist too, but, but I have to qualify it because there, there are so many things that go along with this Calvin and progressive sanctification, you know, one of the most diabolical doctrines that has ever entered into church history. You know, this idea that I am somehow becoming more and more impeccable like Christ. <laughs> I mean, I, I was there and looking back, I'm like, how could I be in such deceived denial? Well, I got to be patient right? Mm -hmm. I got to be patient. As much damage as it's doing to people, I still have to be patient. So yeah, thank you both for, for doing that. And, and one last thing, people tend to look at the word dispute in the old King James when, after much disputing, right? If you look at that Greek word there, it's where it's the root word for dialogue word for dispute it's not fight in fact paul actually had to confess for for being uh unnecessarily volatile where he said oh of the 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 resurrection i'm called into question and then it caused this huge you know fight between the sadducees and pharisees paul ended up admitting that he shouldn't have done that instead if we look at those words dispute for what they really mean dialogue keep in mind king james was in this period of you know and so yeah they're going to put that oh he was debating right no we dialogue we dialogue with atheists we dialogue with liberals we dialogue with post-millennial reconstructionists you know we dialogue and we when we do it in love man they may not agree but at least they can't charge us with being cruel or mean or unchrist like in our behavior amen 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 brother well thank you for you, you know again displaying that spirit and uh, while none of us do it perfectly you do it well and i appreciate you for that and uh many of you know uh, ward obviously his youtube channel ncmi live on youtube we want to encourage you to go ahead and visit ncmi live and also uh we uh, want to encourage you to look forward to our upcoming conference, obviously in October 2023. Ward's going to be here with us for the Kingdom and Worldview Conference. I'm imagining this is not the last time that you've heard about things like love, kindness, grace, uh, you know, peace. Uh, these are things that are attributes of the kingdom uh, that we, humility, uh, let me throw that in there. Uh, these are attributes of the kingdom that we, uh, we praise God for and that we live in. So I look forward to Ward, you being here with us. Uh, that's October 6th through the 8th, 2023 here in Blue Point, New York, Blue Point Bible Church. Uh, we will have a lot of information uploaded to our website, bluepointbiblechurch.org, here in the near future. So uh, that way you could get your hotel, you could make sure you're joining with us. It's a free conference. Uh, we might put up a registration just to see how many people. We're hoping for a uh, true revival spirit where there's gonna be many people here and uh, we believe that to be the case. So uh, you'll hear more from uh, Ward in that regard. I did want to mention uh, just two quick things for some of my Long Islanders that might be tuned in here. Uh, Johnny Ova is a friend of mine, and he does a podcast called Dig In, and you want to lean in on this topic of reformation and revival and uh, just, you know, the beauty of God's kingdom. I encourage you to go over to Spotify, Apple, whatever you use to listen to podcasts and give his podcast a listen, again, called Dig In. And then another exciting thing we have happening here on Long Island right here at the end of the month, March 31st. Uh, we have Long Island Awakening. There you go, revival. And uh, I know it's going to be a great night of worship music and you know Christians gathering together, hopefully bringing forth the true spirit of Reformation revival, an increase in peace, an increase in humility, an increase in looking at God for who he is and his greatness and allowing that for us to see ourselves and who we are 
And again, just praising God for the possession and increase of the things that make us effective and fruitful in our use of the knowledge of God. If you don't know where to find that, by the way, that's 2 Peter chapter 1. Great text. If you need some growth in your life, a great text to be uh, praying about, pondering. And uh, again, I mentioned the, uh, the Long Island Awakening, Johnny Ova, the conference here. Those are some great opportunities for you to experience reformation and revival in your own life. Now, I know some of you might be tuned in and saying, this is the Preterist Power Hour, and these men dealt with nothing of what's been going on with Gary DeMar. Well, folks, that means you need to keep tuning into the Preterist Power Hour. Don't worry. We have a lot to say about it. In times to come, we will. And uh, I encourage you to visit powerofpreterism.wordpress.com to pay attention to our blogs and see the different details that we've been sharing. Ward, can I ask you to close us in a word of prayer? Sure, for sure. Thank you, Michael. Well, Father, we're just amazed at your love. We're amazed that you've been so patient with us. And uh, we're amazed that you continue to use us in spite of ourselves. That uh, you continue to use Michael and Edward and um, all these wonderful people online. And I just pray we would have tender hearts toward them, that we would never be complacent about our lack of tenderness and grace. That we would, like Jesus and Paul, Speak with unction about Jesus. Lord, may we not be ashamed to use your name, the name of Jesus. Yes. You're exalted above all else. Lord, in a culture where God has become somewhat generic, uh, you know, culture of pluralism, Lord, we, we want to stand out as those who are just eminently loving and always giving thanks to Jesus. His name, Lord, Yahweh saves Jesus, our almighty God, and his finished work and his kingdom. And may we do it in a way that is relevant, that is patient, and, and that remembers how you have dealt with us tenderly and lovingly. Uh, you said you, you gently lead us by these, these streams of water. You gently lead us. May we be gentle with others. And Lord, I know for me, I just... Again, I, I apologize for not being gentle and not being patient. And boy, when I remember what you endured, and yet you, you were reviled and you reviled not again, but committed yourself to the Father. And may we do that too. Thank you. Bless Michael. Bless his ministry. Lord, uh, bless his church. Bless Blue Point. Yes, Lord. Give them all just tremendous joy in the knowledge of Jesus, tremendous joy in the knowledge of fulfillment, what he has accomplished, not just as the past, but what we get to revel in and live in now. Uh, bless Edward with that same knowledge, Vicki and all the rest of them, the deacons, that are just what a wonderful group, Lord. Bless them mightily and bless Long Island and prepare hearts for the October conference. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Uh, thank you, Ward, for being here. Thank you all for tuning in. Those of you on Facebook, those of you here in our live Zoom session, uh, you're all a blessing. Ward, God bless you. I'll see you soon and talk with you soon. All right. Thank you, Michael. Love you guys. God bless.